welcome to IdeaGen TV presented globally by Microsoft. We're so excited to be here today with our colleague and good friend, Rosalind Doctor. Rosalind, welcome. Thank you, George. It's an incredible opportunity to talk about your role as Vice President for Technology and Science Policy worldwide and Vice President for the Middle East and Africa. That's quite a big title. <laughs> Yes, it's a, it's a thrill to represent IBM and to wear those hats and to have heard the conversation earlier and to be part of IdeaGen because it's all about partnerships and exchanging ideas. In order to advance good policy, we need to hear from diverse actors. IBM operates all over the world and our license to operate can be summed up in one word, trust. We have been the trusted stewards of technology, responsible technology for over a hundred years. We serve 90% of the world's largest banks, 80% of the world's largest telco, 50% of all retail touches IBM's AI, blockchain, cloud, data, products, and services. And we earn the trust of our clients and the trust of society by being the responsible stewards of technology. And to advance policy, it has to have that backbone of trust, right? We want a good policy to promote trustworthy tech is that uh, companies like IBM are responsible, but new companies, early entrants, how do we have a framework of trust? So IBM created the policy lab to bring forward dialogues just like this with like-minded people that want to promote trusted technology and we talk to diverse stakeholders, uh, governments, we partner with them, we partner with the government of Singapore on AI, we partner with nonprofits on privacy events, but it's bringing people together and hearing from those diverse voices with the foundation of wanting to advance trusted technology that can make us effective. You know, it's it's so great that you're, you're bringing up trust because at IdeaGen, the focus of what we do is based on trust. And I'll add to that authenticity. Yes. It's important in order to develop that trust, to have that authenticity, because it's the backbone of this cross-sector notion of solving many, so many of the world's most vexing issues. And you're helping to lead teams in the region that we talked about and worldwide and to advance IBM's public policy, especially with this new lab that you described. And in, in addition to your business objectives, would you share Rosalind, a little bit about how these global partnerships come to bear. How are you effectively utilizing these partnerships to move the needle on behalf of IBM? Great question. And let me give you a specific example. I talked about the policy lab and we partner with governments and nonprofits, and that's when IBM takes the lead. But we also like joining other partnerships like this dialogue today. So we worked with a think tank uh, downtown, CSIS, and they wanted to talk about quantum. Quantum computing, everybody wants to know, how do you become a quantum scientist? What are quantum computing? And what are the policy implications? So we brought together three really smart quantum scientists, all women, one from government, one from IBM, and one from academia. And we had this conversation, but we didn't stop there, George, because we want diverse voices. IBM also started a thing called P-TECH, which is a new partnership that takes high school students and gives them a four to six year degree, associate's degree by partnering with community colleges and having an institution like IBM provide mentorship. We had these P-TECH students be part of that dialogue because we're getting these P-TECH students career ready or college ready and understanding emerging tech and the policy implications is important. It is also important for policymakers to understand the implications of these technologies on the students in the future generations. So that's what we talk about when we bring together diverse voices to emerging and, and new issues and doing so authentically, having these kids speak for themselves in a dialogue with three amazing uh, women quantum scientists. Well, we could talk quantum all day long, couldn't we? It's, uh, it's incredible what's happening. We talk meta and the metaverse. We could speak about all sorts of different things that are coming at us in the future as we like to say peering around the corner. And we heard in the previous panel, and it's apropos that, you know, we're in this moment where it feels like <laughs> we were stuck in 2020. 2021 is here, we're almost in 2022. And it feels like, you know, as we were focused on the global goals of the United Nations and helping to achieve those goals, those 17 global goals. And I think everyone would agree that 
that we cannot achieve these goals without partnerships. Exactly. Rosalind, what makes a good partnership? Well, I think we've already talked about one of those is trust. That's right. Right? Shared values of trust. And I'd also say shared values of innovation that matters. Right? That we want to work together towards a common goal that advances not just the people involved, but the larger group. And so we shift a bit to AI. Oh, I love AI. That's what I thought. <laughs> so um, AI, how will AI... We hear a lot about AI. How is AI going to change the future of our lives? How is it going to impact us all? What What do you see? What do you see in this crystal ball? And how does then, maybe you can add, since we're facing Washington, D.C., how does that impact policy? Yeah, great, great questions. And we'll come back to trust. But let me first tell you my view of AI. I see AI as not artificial intelligence, but augmented intelligence. Hmm. And I see AI, and it does have risks, as all technology has risks. It could, if not wielded responsibly, um, increase or exasperate long-standing inequalities. But I also see AI as a powerful force for good. I see AI that can actually mitigate human biases, human biases that we might not be aware of. IBM worked with Mayo Clinic to increase, to increase the participants in clinical trials. We need more women doing breast cancer clinical trials. And to get somebody in a clinical trial takes a lot of human work. You gotta put data from a lot of different sources. We used AI and the doctor in Mayo Clinic says it better than I do, uh, that by using AI, we actually were able to mitigate some human biases. If I walk in and a, a very overworked, very well-meaning clinical trial matching person sees me and hears that I'm overworked, I'm a mother, they might not recommend me for a clinical trial, just thinking they're doing well for me or not even realizing. But when you introduce AI, you increase the number of women who could be matched with the clinical trial. You then increase, increase clinical trial effectiveness and you help with cancer. So that's one example of where AI is actually mitigating bias and being a force for good. I have another great example I like to give on, on a, AI. We put AI on a collar of dogs. What? So guide dogs right? It actually takes a lot to identify which puppies will be the best guide dogs for people who are blind. Um, by putting AI and helping understand dogs' emotions, uh, the environment, what they're feeling and sensing, we can speed the time to know that this puppy it will be a really good guide and eye dog. And we can uh, in increase the effectiveness of having them lower the cost and get more dogs for people with disabilities. These are two examples of where I see AI as a force for good. We have many examples. And what's important that you didn't ask, but is that we are not just creating AI for the world, but we're working with the world as we create AI. So as I said, we want diverse voices and policy conversations. We also need diversity in creating AI to not exasperate inequalities. We're working with nonprofits and we bring them in and we incubate with them so that they who are serving the underserved can help us create and improve our AI. You know, it's so great to hear that you're bringing in that authentic element to AI. You're bringing in the perspective and perhaps I guess I would add to it the empathy is what I'm hearing. You're bringing in the empathy because without empathy, you're talking over people and issues. When you bring in the empathy, you're supposed to be walking in their shoes. Yes. Or in the instance of a guide dog, figure out which dog is the is the best to be able to perform on behalf of their owner. And so I think there's an opportunity here to really, you know, link back to the authenticity and the trust. I think if what makes people nervous, I think about AI is, can we trust it? And what you're saying is you're leading with the trust. Right. Well, I do think there's a role for policy because I think IBM, we, we have committed that we can explain the AI that, that we're doing. We can explain how and why that dog gets selected for the program or not selected to the program to the dog handler. Right. We, we can't explain it to, to, to every detail to everybody, but to those who are making the decisions. Right. Because it's augmented intelligence, not artificial intelligence. But there is a role for Congress and a role for all of our lawmakers to put in some safeguards so that society can trust the technology. We think that high risk technology, uh, highest risk AI and hiring 
right, in, in financial management, that there should be tests for bias before it's on the market, that you should know when you're interacting with AI, right? Most times we know on chatbots, but do we know on, on other instances of whether AI is there? You should know whether AI made that decision or helped make that decision and should be tested for bias. There should be fairness and explainability. And explainability, and that makes sense. So that you're, there's some sort of a disclaimer that you're suggesting be part of it, that you are now engaging with AI-driven- Disclosure. Ex disclosure. Yes. That's fantastic. That's a really incredible perspective. I want to stay on that topic, but I'm also interested in talking about your broader role. And let's talk a little bit about Africa. Oh. Okay. Uh, and I know this is a, a passion piece for you because this, you know, you're so versed and so, um, focused. I was a Peace Corps volunteer in rural right. Zambia. <laughs> Peace Corps volunteer in rural Zambia. That's incredible. You do a lot of work in Africa. How are you helping to skill and educate people in Africa? What, what, what are you doing? Sure. And I personally am not doing it, right? Just as you heard from <laughs> others, it takes a team, right? right. Uh, so IBM made a commitment that we're going to train 30 million people by 2030 worldwide. And we do this at various levels. I told you about P-TECH in the US. We have open P-TECH. So the same courses that, that we teach here and that we've worked through partnerships, anyone can get access across the globe. We also partner on the university level. I see the ambassador from Ethiopia is with us and I'm honored he's here today. For those that don't see him, you'll see him later. Uh, we are working to train 364, well, we've already trained them, university professors just in Ethiopia from 50 different universities on computer science, on AI, on cybersecurity, and on cloud. So we, chain, we train the trainers, right? And we also try to impact at the grassroots level, especially around women and girls, right? So let's take West Africa and Nigeria. We are working with junior achievement to provide girls with technology skills and entrepreneurial skills so they can start businesses. Back in East Africa, we're helping the Digital Opportunity Trust uh, have women be women in ICT ambassadors to bridge the gender gap, get them more skilled to get others skilled in technology. So we look at it at how can we help at the academic level, how can we help at the entrepreneur level, and how can we help at the individual level, not only with upskilling through free online training, but also in job matching. That's where the AI comes in. The AI can scour and understand and predict where the jobs are and give that information to somebody who says, I want to do something in STEM, but what should I do? And so through job matching, they can say, look, these courses are in demand. These are the badges that employers want. Maybe you start there. Or if you have a badge, okay, I have this badge. Who's looking for somebody with these skills? Rosalind, that's incredible. And it's incredible to hear connecting of the dots, right? Connecting the dots to take the expertise of IBM and match it with individuals anywhere on the planet that could use upskilling, retraining, very familiar with P-TECH, incredible program, and scaling that and bringing that to anyone on the planet is just brilliant. Thank you. I want to say you have an opportunity to present to our global audience today a challenge. What is your ask? of anyone on, in the world that's watching this, what would you ask them? What is your, your call to action? First of all, and I don't want to shamelessly promote this, but get involved in conversations like this. We want to have more dialogues with diverse voices, right? So join an idea gen, come join the IBM Policy Lab if you have thoughts on policy. We do research, we do polling, we have dialogues, we involve government, academia, get involved. We want to increase partnerships and diverse voices and partnerships based on that foundation of trust that we talked about earlier, based on those that believe in responsible technology, based on those that believe in innovation that matters in order to build the workforce. We, we've heard it earlier, we've talked about aging, but we also need to look at that workforce and we wanna have a workforce that has the skills, the, the authenticity, and that knows about the importance of trust in order to solve global pandemics or any innovation you know, that matters for us and for the world. You know, Rosalind Doctor, changing the world at IBM. Thank you so very much for the inspiration today. I know our global audience will also be inspired to act, to take that next step, to be involved. What a great message. How can we learn more about IBM and your work? 
go to IBM.com or search on Policy Lab and, and you'll learn and you can see how to get involved. Subscribe to our newsletter, P-Tech. All of this is available on the web and uh, I'm on LinkedIn. So thank you, George. Reach out to me if you can't find me or go to George. He can find me. Yeah. <laughs>